with you this morning. Um, we're going to start a new series, but as we do, I want to ask, I want to ask a few questions as we get started. What would it have been like to live when Jesus lived? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about the fact that here was Jesus who did all these things, these great things, and back then they had people that, you know, just like we do today, live amongst these great leaders. But with Jesus, it was different. Not only was he a great leader, he was a great man, he was the savior of the world. I don't know, my mind wanders every once in a while, and I think about the fact that what, what it would have been like to, to live with Jesus. And then I take it a step further, and I, I go a little bit deeper, and I ask this question, and it changes everything. What would it be like to have Jesus as your next-door neighbor? <laughs> changes some things. Yeah, we'd like to live when, when Jesus lived. We'd like to hang out. We'd maybe like to watch from afar some of the things that he did. We would like to pick up on and, 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 and be witness to some of the miracles that he performed. But then we take it a step further and we say, what would it be like to have Jesus as our next-door neighbor? And we're like, mm -mm, no, no, I'm not sure that I want that. I mean, at least at our house, there'd be a lot of yelling that he would hear, I'm sure. Right? Maybe you're the same in, in your house where you, you would hear, uh, Jesus would hear, and he would just wonder what was going on next door. In fact, it's Jesus, so he knows what's going on next door, right? A couple more questions as we think about this. What would we want to see Jesus do? Whether it be as our next door neighbor or whether it be we were fortunate enough to live or maybe not fortunate enough, however you look at it, to live when Jesus lived, uh, to live amongst him. What would we want to see what are some things that we want to see him do? As we read the Gospels, as we look at Scripture, as we know what Jesus did, what are some things that we might pick out from the stories, the things that the, the, the factual things that we see in Scripture? What are those things that we would love to have seen or want to see him do? What would we want to hear him say as he speaks to the crowds? as he unpacks history, as he foretells what was going to happen in the near future. We're starting a new series this morning called Encounters with Jesus, and we're going to spend the summer, uh, 10 weeks, and I know that seems like a lot, but what I want to try to do is just be able to, you know, in the four weeks, we're, we're kind of rushing towards the, the, the goal line, rushing towards the finish line. In six weeks, we're, we're not quite sitting back. And in 10 weeks, we can kind of rest as we look at the broader stroke, the broader picture of, God, of the gospel of Jesus. But here's what I want us to get through as we understand in the next uh, 10 weeks that the same Jesus that we'll see in our scripture, the same Jesus that we see uh, share his word, share stories as he lives life, that very same Jesus that these people encountered every day of their lives is the very same Jesus that we encounter every day of our lives. But sometimes we forget that it's the same Jesus. And we think to ourselves, oh, that's that, 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 that Jesus, I, I love Jesus, I know Jesus, but he couldn't possibly understand what I'm going through because, you know, back then things were different. It's completely different. Now, let me just say this, that God's word, the, the, the one that we hold at this, at this church, at this, at, this, at this place, at this moment that we hold in high regard, that same Jesus, that same word that comes to us every Sunday when, when we read the Bible throughout the week, that very same word, applies today just as much as it applied then. And so I want us to just, over the next 10 weeks, just to kind of sit back and let God teach us. Let God fill us. And I pray through that time that we would encounter the real Jesus. 
the Jesus that we see in God's Word. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump in uh, this morning for our time together. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have the opportunity to come and, and, and to, to worship you. God, thank you so much for your word, for what it does, what it tells us, how it's sharp, how it, how it disciplines us, how it structures us, how it gives us hope, gives us a future, gives us understanding, gives us guidance, leads and protects us. God, I thank you for this time, this moment that we have every week just to open up your word, to be challenged by it, to come collectively together as a body and learn from it. Father, we love you. We thank you for everything you bless us with. We ask now that you be with us, that you would challenge us, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us. Whatever, Father, we need, step on our toes, lead us, and God, instill in us the the willingness to follow. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So this morning I want to ask two questions, two real questions. We started off with some, you know, some, some basic questions, but l- let's get down to the, to the nitty-gritty, if you will. How many would, would like to move forward? And I, I, well, no judgment here, just, just asking some questions. How many of you this morning would like to move forward in your walk with Jesus? Anybody? Okay, good, good, good. Okay, it gets a little bit deeper, all right? Again, no judgment, no judgment at all. How many of you felt like maybe over the last week, over the last uh, couple of months, maybe even over the last year, you felt like maybe you're in a spiritual rut? Raise your hand. Again, no judgment, no judgment. It's a part of it, right? We, we're, we're on this journey. And though we may not have raised our hand, we may feel like it. Though we raised our hand, we, we definitely feel like it. We feel like, you know, we're in this spiritual rut and we're trying to make sense of what God is leading us to and where he's, where he's driving us, right? This morning, we're going to look at five definites. I know that seems like a lot. But we're going to be looking at five definites to move us forward in our relationship with Christ. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. If you have it on your phone, you can use that. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you don't have the Bible app on your phone, you don't have a Bible with you, there's a Bible uh, back there, a couple, actually several Bibles back there on that cart. We will not point and look at you and go, why don't you have your Bible? Just sneak back there, grab it. If you don't have a Bible at home and you need a Bible, grab one of those either now or on your way out. We want you to have God's Word in your house, looking at it, meditating on it, reading it daily so that your walk can improve. So we're going to read together here with Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 22 and continuing into verse 33. And, you know, there's a, there's a, this is a big passage. And, and, and if you've been with us for a while, you'll notice that sometimes I'll read long passages, sometimes I'll read short passages, and here's the reason why. I want to make sure that when we read the longer passage, no matter what we read, we gain context. Because God's Word, in order to apply it to our life, we have to understand context. And so this is a longer passage, but we gain context from all of this. Many of us might be familiar with this this. Uh, this this uh, situation that happens here, beginning with verse 22. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead uh, of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he, dismissed the, uh, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from uh, land buffeted by the waves because, of the wind, because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, and I let, let me just stop there for a second. This is me, by the way, this part, and I'm going to talk about more how this is me, but I love Peter. I love his courage. I love his, well, his ignorance at times. Continuing here in verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out to you on the water. Verse, <laughs> verse 29, come, he said. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and the beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? 
And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Verse 33, then those who were uh, in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. So the first definite we we see here uh, is, is this. God definitely has a plan for me. God definitely has a plan for all of us, right? He definitely has a plan. The disciples had just been involved in some pretty intense situations. Many people call it ministry, right? So, so, so they're, they're, they're doing their thing. Hanging out with Jesus wasn't just your ordinary, you know, sit down, write a sermon, answer a couple phone calls. No, being with Jesus and doing ministry was serious stuff. It was it's pretty rough stuff. So here the disciples are hanging out with Jesus, and these guys had, they, they had just dealt with the murder of John the Baptist. Now, I've been doing ministry for 30 years. Never experienced the murder of anybody. And here are these disciples who are hanging out with Jesus and, and are instantly thrusted into their, their, their friends. See, a lot of what we, what we forget is that a lot of these disciples had followed John first. And so now they're hanging out with Jesus, they're following Jesus, their mentor, their best friend, their teacher has been murdered. And now they're thrust, they don't have time to grieve because right after this they're on the heels of, of Jesus preaching again and he's on the, on the hillside and he's preaching and there's thousands of people. And they're involved in the feeding, the, the very first incident of feeding of, of the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. So they don't have time to, 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 to grieve. They don't have time to mourn. They don't have time to go back to, to, to see what's going on, to, to make sure that his body gets released. They don't have any time for that. They're, they're, they're doing ministry, and, and they're running around with their hair on fire. And so Jesus, I'm, I'm trying to create this moment, help us understand what's happening here. Jesus tells them, guys, get in the boat and go find some place to rest. See, Jesus understood that ministry is draining. Jesus tells these disciples, get out of here. I'll meet up with you. Go. They needed some R&R. And he recognized that. You see, oftentimes for us, we don't, we don't think that Jesus can relate to us. Like I said in the, in the introduction part of this, a lot of times we think that, that you know, what happened back in, in, in biblical times, what happened in Jesus' time, but that, 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 that's different than what happens today. How in the world could Jesus possibly relate to me? How could he possibly understand? He has no clue what I'm going through. I'm here to tell you this morning, he does. He understands. I found this little anecdote about a, a captain. Justin, you'll get a kick out of this. By the way, this is my brother Justin. He, we look alike. We're not twins. My younger brother. I, I put you on the spot, bro. <laughs> Don't ask him any questions. I've sworn him to secrecy. He doesn't take bribes. You don't take bribes. You, yeah, you, you'll like this story. So a man became a captain of a battleship. You may have even heard this. And on a stormy night, he saw a light closing in on the ship. He got on the radio and ordered whoever it was to alter their course 10 degrees to the south. A voice came back over the radio. No, you alter your course 10 degrees to the north. The captain snapped back. Alter your course 10 degrees. I am the captain. To which the voice responded back. Alter your course 10 degrees. I am seaman third class Jones. You remember this story? (laughs) To which the infuriated captain yelled back. Alter your course. I am a battleship. To which he heard. Over the speaker. Alter your course. I am a lighthouse. Isn't that what happens in our walk with Christ? We have the audacity to be the captain yelling at 
God, the lighthouse. You, you, don't, you understand what the lighthouse's job is. The lighthouse's job is to keep us on course so that the ship doesn't run aground. The lighthouse, our lighthouse job is to make sure that the path is clear, that we don't run aground, that we don't get caught and entangled in the sin that so easily in, in, entangles us. And yet we're, we have the audacity to yell at God and say, get on our course I we refuse to get on your course. You see, the purpose of the lighthouse has always been and will always be to set a clear path. You see, God has a plan for you, and it's good. He has a plan for me, and it is good. And in fact, it is designed specifically and uniquely for you and I. There's a second definite that I want us to see here. God definitely sees everything I'm going through. Look at what transpires here in verses 23 and 24. It says, after he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already considerable, a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against him. So after Jesus sends them away, he goes up on a mountainside to pray. And the area, and we've been, we were fortunate enough in 2017 to travel and, and, and some of you are, are familiar with, with the story. Uh, we, we were fortunate enough to travel to the Holy Land, and we got to spend some time uh, in, a, in a hotel there on uh, the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus, I, I know exactly. If you get a chance, just a side note real quick, if you get a chance to go to the Holy Land, do it. I know it's expensive, but here's what happens. When you go to the Holy Land and you see what, what, what uh, is out there, then what you read on the page comes to life. It's 3D. And so I, I, when I'm reading this, I'm picturing exactly, we're in a hotel across the Sea of Galilee, and I see the mountains. Now, the Sea of Galilee, for those of you, and, and Larry, you probably would correct me on this, uh, maybe. I didn't think the Sea of Galilee was as big as I thought it was. It's big for Kansas, right? I mean, we have little ponds, uh, and we have a few lakes, but it wasn't as big as I thought. If you stand on the, on the, the, the north or, or the south side, you can see across it. You can see to the other side. But they also say that when the moon is bright, and I can attest to this, that when the moon is bright, you can see everything. And so one night we're sleeping, and I'm like, it is bright in this room, and I don't get it. What's going on? So I opened, peeked out the curtain, and the moon is shining, and it's hitting the Sea of Galilee, and it's lighting things up. So here's Jesus, he's on the other side from where we're at, and he's, he's on the mountain, and he's praying. He can see everything, and it's dark, and he can see everything. He can see for miles and miles and miles, and he's praying, and I believe he sees what's taking place. I believe he sees, he sees the disciples fighting the wind. Normally, the, the, the Sea of Galilee is pretty much glass-like, not always, but pretty close. And so they're struggling. They, they started out, and they haven't made it to the other side, which they could have very easily made it to the other side, but they're fighting, and Jesus sees this. And I think Jesus, I, I believe he's praying for things, for lots of things. I, I, I think he's praying for Jerusalem. I think he's praying for the hearts of the people that he just taught. I think he's praying for the people to pick up on what's to come. I think he's praying for his disciples. I think he's, he's seeing and he's praying for a lot of things. You see, the same thing happens today as we do life. God knows everything about us. He cares for us. He sees everything that we're going through. And I was reminded, and I may have shared this story I don't think uh, I have yet, but if, if you have heard this story, forgive me for repeating it, but we, when we got out of college, we moved to, to Wichita, and we moved into an apartment, <clears throat> which probably wasn't the smartest thing, but it was, it was the smartest thing in, initially, but there was, apartment life is apartment life. You either love it or you hate it, and we definitely didn't like it. And there was all kinds of noises and all kinds of loud, and, and, you know, people are doing their thing, and you're trying to be respectful, and, and you know, you don't want to make a scene because they know where you live. And, and so uh, we finally said, you know, apartment living's not for us. And so 
being the, the smart and wise 20-something, young 20-something that I was, I said, I'm going to go down and I'm going to tell, I'm done with this, I'm going to go tell the office tomorrow morning that we, we're going to not renew our lease. And so I go down and I tell them, hey, we're not going to renew our lease. I was nice, fairly nice about it. I said, hey, we're not going to renew our lease. And they said, okay, fine. So I left. I kid you not, about a week, two weeks later, they said, hey, we rented your place. Um, we want to know when you can move out. Uh, come again? Yeah, we rented your place. You said you weren't going to renew your lease, and, and so we just want to know. I mean, we're not going to kick you out, but when there's people ready to move in. We just want to know. So we click, quickly pack up all of our stuff, and, and, and we knew that we needed a house. We, we were looking for a house. We wanted to have children, and, and so we pack up all of our stuff. Dave Castleberry helped me. You remember Dave. Dave, Dave we throw all of our stuff in there, and uh, we, we head for some place. Dave said, you, you, you could stay with us. I was like, I really don't want to stay with you, right? He goes, well, I, I, we got a, an apartment over the garage. I said, well, I really don't want to live in an apartment. That's what we're trying to get away from. He says, well, there's no one below you but vehicles. I said, all right. So we knew we could, that was going to be temporary. We only wanted it to be temporary, and so we started looking for houses. And, I mean, we looked, and we looked, and we looked, and we looked. You get the idea. We couldn't find anything, couldn't find anything, couldn't find anything. And so one night I remember saying to Heidi, look, I, I'm done with this. I don't want to live in this. I, I, I don't know what we're going to do, but I do know one thing. I, I, I said, I, I believe we need to turn this over to God. Why we didn't turn it over to God earlier, I have no idea. Well, I have an, I'm Peter. That's why we didn't turn it over to God. But so we prayed, and, and so I felt at peace about it driving. That was when I, we worked at Glen Park, and I was driving down the road uh, about a block from, from, from work, from the church. I, I always looked down the streets, especially during that time, to see if there was any houses for sale. And there was a house for sale, and I was like, well, I surely didn't see that. So I went around the block, and I parked in front of the house. And I'm like, oh, this is great. So I call Heidi, and she's, ladies, we love you. Us husbands, we love you. But sometimes you ask questions that we can't answer. So I'm sitting in front of the house, and I call Heidi, and I said, I, I found this house for sale. She goes, what does it look like? Uh, it's got shingles, and uh, well, it's got a front door. Uh, what else are you, I'm not, in the, I'm not in there, Heidi, I don't know. And she goes, well, call the realtor, call the realtor. I, okay, fine, call the realtor. It gets better. So I get on the phone with the realtor, and I said, hey, Jan, I, I, we found this, this place. And it's, it's 2903 South Hiram, and we really, we really want to look at it. And she goes, what's the address? I said, it's 2903 South Hiram. She goes, you're not going to believe this. I'm in the house right now. I said, are you, you what? She goes, yeah. She goes, it's gorgeous. Oh, that doesn't matter to me, but okay. <laughs> she goes, you're going to want to, this house is going to go quick. You're going to want to, you're going to want to put a, you, I said, well, okay, it's Wednesday. We got church. Uh, can we look at it before church? So we run over, we look at it. I say, oh yeah, Heidi likes it. We got to put a, we got to, we got to put a, 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 yeah, an offer. Thank you. We got to put an offer on this. She goes, well, you can write the contract, but the, the agent, I know the agent, she's not going to accept the, the contract because you won't get out of church in time for to sign the contract, for me to deliver the contract. She doesn't take anything after nine o'clock. And I'm like, well, all right, we're not going to get the house. So we'll write the contract. So after church, we run over. I felt really, really compelled by by the Holy Spirit, and so I told her we're, we're writing, and I said, you got to present this contract tonight. She goes, you don't understand. If we present this contract tonight, you'll lose the house. I know, I said, that's illegal. She can't. She, she's got to accept the contract. She goes, she will not let her, her, uh, her sellers know about the contract. She refuses to accept contracts. I said, you know what? If we lose the house, we lose the house. So present the contract tonight. She's like, okay. I said, you don't understand, there's this, God is telling me that you, we've got to do this. This is, everything has just fell into place. You don't understand the backstory, and I'll, one of these days I'll explain it to you, but we got to do this. And she's like, okay. So that was it. I think she presented at 9.15, 9.30. At 11 o'clock, she called us and said the house was yours. You would think that that would be enough experience that for the, for the rest of my life, I would trust God. But I don't. Right? God knows us. He knows every bit of us. He sees us and he answers 
for us everything that we are going through. Just like Jesus saw the disciples out on that Sea of Galilee, struggling, and he was praying, he saw them. There's a third definite. God's help and timing are definitely impeccable. And, and that story should prove that, that that's impeccable. And you would have thought, like I said, that I would have be- believed and trusted God. That's a great experience. Why would I ever doubt him again? Because I'm Peter. Look at what God's timing is here. Matthew 14, 25, verse 25 through 27. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, something to note here, in biblical times, the nights were divided into four sections called watches. The first watch started somewhere around 6 p.m., and when Jesus comes out to the lake, it's the fourth watch, and it's somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. from what, from what we can all tell with the, the theologians and the studying and all of that, somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. But my, but my first question as I read this is, why does Jesus wait? Why does he wait? He sees them. He, he sees what's going on. From his vantage point, they appear to be battling the winds. It isn't even possible, and we kind of experienced this, that storms would pop up. They'd roll up over the mountain, boom, there was a storm. You wouldn't even have any kind of warning. The storms would just pop up. So it's possible that, you know, a storm is coming, but we don't know that. We don't read that. And we're not sure why Jesus waits other than he's praying. He's just praying. But it brings up a a question for us, possibly. Why does God sometimes wait to answer us when we pray? We don't understand it. We we don't understand God's delays. And we gripe and we complain about the delays, but, but he has a reason. And here's my thought on this. I believe that God delays answers to help reveal in us, catch this, his character. It's a teachable moment. Because as a people, we are anything but patient. And so some of these teachable moments are required for us to grow and for him to develop his character in this, in us. Let me try to explain this. Remember the story of Joseph. It's in uh, Genesis 37 through 42, the story of Joseph. And, and most of us remember the story of Joseph. Joseph gets this word from God that, that he's going to be greater than his brothers and his brothers are going to bow down and, and all of this. And then 16 years later, after this, God reveals this to him, he finds himself in jail, right? Because supposedly he did something and basically someone lied to get him, that got him put in jail, right? This is for real. If you, if you ever wonder about soap operas and all of that, it's, it's right here. You can read it for yourself. Genesis 37 through 42. I'm not lying about this. This stuff happens. And so he finds himself in jail. And the whole time, people will say, that was just wasted time. Let me explain something. God doesn't waste anything. It was not in vain because during that whole time, God was building his character inside of Joseph. And we see that story continue and play out. See, our time is not necessarily God's time. Never has been. Never will be. Again, it's us yelling at the, at the lighthouse. My time, my time, get with me. See, that same house that we purchased, we sold it years later. We were moving to, to Missouri and the market was, you know, what it is, and, and it was, they, they told us, you're barely going to get what you, what you bought for it. And I'm like, well, why are we selling it then? Maybe we rent it. My dad said, don't rent it. You're going to be gone, and I'm going to be stuck with it. And I said, okay, yeah, you're right. So they said, well, we'll try to sell it. And I said, okay. So we moved. Here's the crazy thing. They said, we're going to barely be able to clear 75 for it. And I said, well, we got to sell it. And so if that's all we can clear, then I guess God will take care of us. 
that was my prayer. I guess God, now he bought us the house, he got us the house, but I guess God will take care of us. Peter, Peter. So it's not on the market very long. It was like three to 10 days at the very most. They come to us and they say, we can't believe, we got a contract. And not only that, but you're in a bidding war. And they said, this is amazing. We haven't seen this in the market. And um, look like you're going to get about 95 out of it. That should have been enough, right? That should have been enough. Like, okay, God shows up, gets us the house. Then he shows up with extra money that is not in the marketplace. It's not happening, but God shows up and does his thing. He, he, he's, he's aware of it. He, he, he knows us. His timing is impeccable. His help is impeccable. That should have been enough, but it wasn't. Why? Because I'm Peter. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all have a little bit of Peter in us, right? We question God. We, we don't want to. And, and, and we're sitting here going, I don't want to admit that I question God, but you do. God's timing and his help are impeccable. And catch this, they can never be matched. Never. Nothing comes close to the impeccable timing and impeccable help that only God can give us. But there's a fourth definition. You're going to think, man, you should have learned earlier because now we're on number four. We could have been over with number three, right? But there's four. There's actually five. There's one more. God's purpose is definitely for my growth. His purpose is definitely for my growth. This is the third storm that we see about Peter's life. And we see that Peter isn't the best at following through. But he does grow as a result. And so we see, notice this growth opportunity for Peter in verses 28 and 29. It says, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come. I love this story. Tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. See, God wanted, he wanted Peter to be secure with his actions as much as he was with his mouth. Right? I mean, he said, let's go back and look at it. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. So this is how I take it. All right, big shot, God says. Come on out here. You want to say with your mouth, you've been, I've heard you talking. I've heard you saying things. I've heard you. So then come on. Step out here with me. Now, God isn't arrogant like me, right? He didn't say quite say it that way, but that's, this is my take. It's paraphrased, of course. But this is kind of how it goes. God wanted Peter to be as secure with his actions as he was with his mouth. We all have storms in our life. We all have storms in our life. There isn't one of us in here that hasn't had at least one storm of some sort in the amount of years that we've been alive. And they all have a purpose. They all have a plan. And they're for our growth. See, God doesn't give us a test with all the answers. He give us, gives us all the answers for the test. And that answer is a simple answer. And his name is Jesus. That's the answer. But we're looking for all the other answers. We're trying to figure it all out. We're trying to piecemeal it together to try to get it to work and to make sense. And God gives us the answer for the test, and that answer is him. But we're looking all over the place trying to get God to match up with who we are and what we want and what we desire in our plan rather than understanding that the answer is Jesus and his plan. I'm reminded of a story about my brother, not this brother, my brother Josh, the one that was here last week. He and his now unfortunate ex-wife, they had they have two kids together. They actually had uh, one uh, who uh, passed away. And I'm reminded, so it was Easter, would have been, she would have been one year younger than my brother, than my son, sorry. And it was Easter, and 
my brother Josh. Man, it's so hard to talk about. Um, he called me up because not only was I his brother, but I was his pastor. And this is extremely difficult. And so they wanted me to see my niece, but they also wanted me to be there to bring comfort to them as they were dealing with the loss of their daughter. They also asked me to do the service, and that was even more difficult. And here I was thinking all along that God, I knew God was going to, I was like, gosh, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know you're going to use me. And here I was being selfish, thinking that God was going to use me through all of this. And what I didn't notice and what I didn't recognize is that God used my brother. At that moment, he vowed that he would become the very best funeral director that he could possibly be. Went through the classes. In fact, I got to spend a little time with him in Oakley as the funeral director in Oakley and as the pastor doing funerals together and watching the compassion that exuded from him. All because they went through what they went through. Now, he's moved to Georgia, and he's not a full-time funeral director anymore, but he still does it on the, on, on the side, part-time. And, and I, I, I can only imagine that what I saw and what happened in, in his life, he, God continues to use and pours out compassion on the lives uh, of family members who are dealing and grieving the way he was dealing and grieving. That's what God does. He allows us to experience things that we're going through to be important for us to learn from for our next journey, for our next portion of life. One more definite, and that is God definitely wants me to trust him. That could have been number one, but, you know, for dramatic sake, we want to leave it till the end because I still haven't learned, right? God wants us definitely to trust him. But look what happens here in verses 30 through 33 as we conclude in this chapter. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Jesus tells Peter to come out of him on the water. Peter goes out of the boat and begins to walk on water. And Scripture says, and if you're okay with writing in your, in your Bible, and I know some of you aren't, and that's okay, and, and, and that's fine, but if you're okay with writing in your Bible or if you're on the app, you can highlight it, you can underline it. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to underline these words. But when he saw. That's the most important phrase in all of that passage. And I'm going to explain why. But when he saw. This denotes something very important. It denotes the focus or lack of that Peter had. My first question when I'm reading this is, what did he see other than Jesus? What did he see other than Jesus? He opens his mouth and says, Lord, if it's you, ask me to come out there. And Jesus said, okay, big shot. What did he see other than Jesus? They make an eye contact. He sees him. He thinks it's a ghost. They say it's a ghost. And then Jesus says, oh, it's not a ghost. Don't be afraid. It's just me. They're making eye contact because Peter says, oh, if it's you, then ask me to come out. They're making eye contact. But what does he see other than Jesus? We find out. Notice what it says. Scripture says that he saw the wind. Have you ever seen the wind? No. Here's what we do see. When you live in Kansas, you see the effects of the wind. Blowing snow, blowing dust, blowing grass, blowing leaves from the trees, blowing flowers, blowing lawn furniture. It's all there. Blowing grills, blowing trash cans. You get the idea. We see the effects of the wind, but we don't see the wind. Catch this. Peter is affected by something he cannot see. 
Is it sinking in? Peter is, he is affected by something he cannot see. Nothing else should have mattered at that moment. He is on top of the water. I don't know how many times I've tried this in my mom and dad's pool when they had a pool. I'd get on the diving board and go, hey, guys, gather around. I'm going to walk on water. I, I would do this. I would run off the diving board. Boom. First step, boom, to the bottom. What would I do? You would think I would learn. I'd get out of the pool. I'd try it again. You can't walk on water. And yet we read in here that Peter is walking on water. Nothing else should have mattered at that moment. Nothing else should have mattered in my life at that moment. God provided a house for us. God sold my house for more than what I was going to get for it. God has shown up time and time and time again in my life. You would think that I would finally get it, but guess what? I don't trust him. And if we're honest, we don't trust him. He wants to do something amazing with us as individuals. He wants to do something amazing with us as a body of believers here at Cornerstone Christian Church. And we don't trust him. We want to, we, 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 we just keep things the same way. We want to do the things that we've been doing. And you know what? God wants to shake us up. He wants us to go out of here and be excited about the fact that we just had a worshipful time with the only God, our Lord and Savior, and we just want to go out and catch lunch. It's now almost 1220. How many of you right now are thinking about the fact that you're late for lunch? And God is ready to do something, but we can't pay attention because we're focused on everything else. God showed up today. He shows up every Sunday. And all we can think about is that the fat, bald guy up there won't shut up so we can go to lunch. Right? I've heard from some of you, you're preaching too long. I'm sorry. But I really am not. What's that say? Sorry, but not sorry. You would think as many times as God has shown up in our life, we would trust him. He has proven himself over and over and over. See, Jesus, Jesus expected Peter to trust him every step of the way. And do you ever think about, why in the world would Peter say, okay, call me out there if he wasn't going to trust him in the first place? How many times have we done that? I know I have. Okay, God, if it's really you, show me this. And he shows it. Oh, I was just kidding. Right? Right? I really didn't think you were going to take me serious. When we decided to go, when God moved us to Oakley, my dad said, people are going to make fun of you. People are not going to understand it. They're going to think you're crazy. We left a church between three to 500 people, staff of seven to nine. It was awesome. And God said, you're done. And I said, no. He said, no, you're done. I want you to go. I was just kidding, God. I, I, I was surrendering my life to you, but I was just surrendering it here, like in this little space. We do that. We do that. I come back to this analogy, and I know you've heard this frequently, but when we graduated from college, we were fortunate enough to come back to Wichita, and I'm thankful every moment along the journey that the churches have given me the opportunity to do what I love to do. And Glen Park was the very first church that gave me the opportunity to love on their kids and maybe a little bit um, crazy for allowing me to love on their kids and trust me like they trusted me. But I remember being hired by Tom Hawks, the former senior pastor at Glen Park. You're going to actually get to meet him in a couple of weeks. He's going to come and fill in for me while I'm on vacation. And um, he said, we want to hire you. And I said, okay, one thing. And you, you all know what I've said to him. I'm not going to preach. I, like, I'll, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll take your kids to camp. I will, but I'm not going to preach. I just won't. And so if that's a deal breaker, adios. I'm as that cocky, that arrogant, you know. And he goes, okay. And I was like, serious? This is going to be a sweet gig. 
Like, I can do whatever I want. I can hang out with kids. I don't have to do this. I can grow this ministry. All the while, you're just doing all the hard work. Here's, here's the reality. I didn't trust God. I did not trust him. I wanted to. I was on fire coming out of college. I was excited. I was going to save the whole world at Glen Park with children's ministry without preaching. But I didn't trust God. I would love to stand here this morning and tell you that I have it all together, that I have everything in line, that everything's perfect, that I trust God with all my heart in every situation, every time, but I don't. But my guess is, neither do any of us. And the great thing is then we can join together and trust God together to do what he has in store for us here at Cornerstone, here in Wichita, here in Bel Air. I'm excited about what God is going to do. If you want to walk on water, you got to know that God has a plan for each of us, that God sees everything that you and I are going through, that God, his help and his timing are impeccable, that God's purpose is for our growth, that God wants you and I to trust him. All of that, we have to know that. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. And as they do, as we encounter Jesus in our lives, much like the disciples, we need to know that God expects us to do something in and with our relationship with him. You see, we can come to church and we can sing the songs and we can leave here unimpacted. We can be impacted but do nothing with it when we leave here. It can be just self-serving. But as we encounter, we are not left unchanged. When we encounter the one and only Jesus Christ, the way people did in Scripture, we are not left unchanged. Do you hear me this morning? We are not left unchanged. Whether we agree with it or not, whether we, whether we feel like it or not, we are not left unchanged. When the hand of Jesus, when the life of Jesus, when the spirit of Jesus affects us, we are not left unchanged. As you encountered Jesus this morning, maybe for the first time, he wants all of you, every single piece of you, not part of you, not just your right arm or your right leg or left knee, he wants every bit of you. As you encountered Jesus today, here's what I hope. I hope that he got your attention because as I was studying this, he got my attention. I hope that he rattled you a little bit this morning. I hope that he woke you up a little bit this morning. Because he expects to do big things with each of us in our relationship with him. Expects, not hopes, not suggests. He expects to do big things with us. As you encounter Jesus today, he wants you to know this. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. You got to get out of the boat. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you. You alone are worthy of our praise, God. We're thankful that we have this moment. God, I'm so grateful that we have you in our lives. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You never turn your back on us. God, you press and you press and you press. God, help us to lean in. Help us to trust you with all of our weight, with all that we are. You've shown up time and time and time again. God, help us to take you for all that you're worth. And just trust. God, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time together. God, keep leaning in on us. Keep showing up. And God, I pray as a body, we can show up to you. 
I pray as individuals, we can begin to turn our lives, let you mold us and shape us into your, what you desire, what you want us to be, what you want us to do, where you want us to go. God, we love you for how you love us. God, I pray that we can learn to know more and more about you so that we can go to serve and make you known. I pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise from Thank you for being here. Don't forget, we have VBS stuff over there. I promise I've kept you long enough now. All the Baptists are gone. You can now go. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Glad you guys are here. Lean in and let God lead you. We'll see you all next week.